Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Looks like we got a good group here so far. Thanks for joining us today, everyone. We'll be talking about keystone tokens and some lessons that we've learned over time running with some different token types in our production environment. I am Brad Picorni. I'm a principal software engineer with Symantec, and I've been working on OpenStack since about 2013 and currently work primarily on Horizon. And this is my colleague, Preeti Desai. Thanks, Brad. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Preeti Desai. I'm an OpenStack developer for IBM. Uh, I work on various OpenStack projects, and one of them is Keystone. Um, so we are all here to find out what is the best token format um, that we can configure in our OpenStack uh, deployments. We have four token formats so far. Um, starting with the oldest UUID, let's take a look at what is UUID. UUID is the simplest uh, token format we have, and it's based on the version 4 UUID. And it's very simple to configure. Just provide the, uh, just specify the provider name, and that's it. Uh, we have the UUID token uh, configured. Now, uh, if I want to uh, get a UUID token for myself, I give credentials. I provide, I initiate a request with my credentials and the target project. What happens next is Keystone validates the um, identity, my identity, whether my user account is valid or not. Next, it gets the uh, project ID, whether this target project exists or not. Next, it basically gets the list of roles that I have on the target project. And it gets the list of services and also the endpoints associated with this, uh, all services. Then it bundles all this information into a token payload, which is in JSON format, and it creates a UUID using this formula. Now, all of this information together is stored in the token backend, and uh, we have our token. So this is how Keystone uh, functions and creates a UUID token. Now, uh, if I take this token and go to any OpenStack services for any resources, uh, the OpenStack service goes sends back request to Keystone for validating the same token. Uh, let's, let's look at the example here. And the key point that I would like to note about here is the ID and also the key in the database. So this is just for simplicity. I got the sample from SQL backend. And also said, uh, uh, note the valid, uh, on the valid field uh, in database. So now when it comes down to the validation, um, the OpenStack service sends a request for validating this token. Keystone retrieves this uh, token payload from the backend, the token backend. It checks whether that valid field is set to true or not. If it's set to true, then it basically gets all the payload and uh, parses the token and retrieves the metadata and checks whether the token is expired, whether uh, it's basically it's expired or not. And also next, it checks whether the token is revoked or not. So this is the high-level workflow of how the token is UUID token is validated using the Keystone service. Upon all of the successful checks, it returns the token payload and with the success. So now the OpenStack service knows that, OK, the, this person is authorized, and you can uh, perform the uh, requests. Now, for example, let's say if I have a UUID token, and for some reason, I feel that I would like to revoke it. How There are many different uh, scenarios where a token can be revoked. But let's say I find uh, a suspicious person having my token, and I would like to revoke this. So what happens in the revocation is when a keystone receives a delete request on the token, it basically using the previous uh, workflow from the previous slide, it validates the token. 
And if the token is valid, then it retrieves the audit ID from that token. After retrieving the audit ID, based on uh, what is the audit ID, it creates a revocation event based on the audit ID. And um, within this new uh, revocation event, it adds the time since when this token is invalid. So this information is bundled up, and uh, it's basically a new revocation event in the SQL database. And after creating the event, it actually uh, goes and prunes, basically filters, deletes all the expired events, whatever events are expired from the uh, database. And then um, it goes back to the token backend and sets that valid field to false. So basically, the token still exists in database. It's just that the valid field is set to false now. So now. Um, Let's look at um, if I have this kind of token format in uh, multiple data centers. I initiate a token request in uh, data center one, uh, retrieve back the token, UUID token, and ask, I, I want a new virtual machine. So Nova configured with Keystone middleware uh, sends back request to Keystone for the validation. Keystone checks the token backend, whether the token is valid or not, and then returns the response to Nova, and Nova uh, goes back and basically creates a new VM for me. Now, if I take the same token and um, I go to a different data center, what happens? So with the same token, I say, uh, give me a new virtual machine in a different data center. Uh, Nova configured with Keystone middleware sends the request to Keystone, and Keystone in turn cannot find that token because in production, in uh, general, the token backends are not replicated because it's not feasible to replicate the entire token backend. So it does not find that token and says failure. Uh, you are not authorized to perform this operation. So from this uh, entire workflow, it's clear that even though UUID is the simplest, it's the lightweight, uh, but it does not support uh, the uh, author authentication and authorization across multiple data, data centers. So now for solving this kind of issue, um, there is a new, there is a different token format, which, which is PKI and PKIZ. And let's look at both of these token formats. Uh, basically, they're pretty much similar to each other, so we can just have a, 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 on the same run. PKI is cryptographically signed using X509 standard. It's not encrypted. The notion is that it was encrypted and secured. It's not. It is just signed. It's in the CMS format, and it is converted into the custom URL safe format. Versus PKIZ is the compressed form of PKI and prefixed with PKIZ to uh, identify that this is PKIZ token. Now, uh, for configuring this kind of token, we need three kinds of certificates. A uh, signing key, so you generate a private key in PAM format, and that becomes the signing key. Now you need the signing certificate. Uh, so using your private key, you uh, basically create a CSR, submit this CSR to a certificate authority, and then retrieve, receive the certificate back from the certificate authority. And then uh, you also need the certificate authority certificate. So these three certificates has to be configured in the Keystone con file, and then you set the provider saying you have either PKI or PKIZ. Now, um, so how, uh, if I'm requesting a token in PKI or PKIZ format, how Keystone and behind the scenes functions? So after, similar to UUID, after validating identity, resources, everything, um, it creates the JSON payload. And now this JSON payload is signed using the signing key and the signing certificate. And in case of PKI, it's converted to the UDF-8 format and then the uh, custom URL safe format. And in case of PKIZ, it's compressed using 
zlib and uh, it's converted to the again custom uh, not custom but base 64 url safe format and then the uh, prefix pkiz is appended to the token and both of these tokens are stored in the backend so now uh, i have this token and i go back to keystone service for validation um, okay let's look at the example here this is the sample again from the SQL backend. And uh, note that the, the longer string, it's just a truncated string of PKI. PKI is huge. Uh, it's in the key. And then there is an ID field. ID is generated using, uh, it's basically hash of the PKI token. So, um, and this is, uh, I, I had um, MD5 uh, by default. It is configurable, so you can configure it to anything. Um, and PKIZ looks something like this. So we have the PKIZ token, and then the ID is again the hash of the token. So now if I take this token uh, back to the Keystone service for validating, what happens? It generates this hash out of the token, and the entire workflow is pretty much same as UUID. It gets back the... Uh, token payload and then checks whether it's valid and retrieves the metadata expiry and revocation. The entire workflow is pretty much same as UUID. So this is, note that this is the Keystone service validating the token and not the Keystone middleware validating the PK token. Keystone middleware, uh, we all know that it's pretty much can uh, validate without going back to Keystone it can validate the PKI token. It decodes the token and checks for the expiry and the revocation. Now, um, so let's say if I again find uh, some suspicious guy having my token, how do I revoke this token? So upon the delete, getting the delete request, the entire workflow is same as UUID. It basically again validates and then revokes the token. Now, um, if I have this token format in multiple data center, I go to data center one, retrieve the PKI token, and then go to Nova, say, give me a new virtual machine, and then um, Nova configured with Keystone middleware, validates the token, and then returns me the virtual machine. Now, using the same token, I go to the different data center and say, give me the virtual machine, Again, NOVA configured with Keystone middleware can validate that token, and then it returns the virtual machine. So this pretty much looks like that it works across the multiple data centers, but note that the services which are configured with Keystone middleware can work. If the, for example, the services like Horizon, if it's configured, uh, if it's integrated directly with Keystone, Remember that Keystone, um, for uh, PKI validation, it needs to have the token backend replicated. It's a persistent token. So it's not basically truly uh, supportable in multi-data center environment. Even though the token validation requests are not sent back to the Keystone service, it doesn't truly support. And the biggest issue is the, lar uh, the size. It's huge. And it's even larger than the standard HTTP header size. And even with the compression, it's not, it's just a 10% of maybe uh, uh, compressed size, but it's still large. And uh, again, the notion is PKI is encrypted, it's secured, it's not. Anybody, whoever has the token, the entire token payload is in the token itself. So anybody can decode that token and look at all the information. So now um, we looked at UUID, PKI, PKIZ. Now there is a new token format for solving this kind of issue. Let's look at the latest new token format for NET. Um, for NET is the cryptographic authentication method, and then it's based on the symmetric key encryption. For uh, symmetric key encryptions, the uh, keys are stored in key repository, and the keys, uh, basically there are multiple keys. So the primary key is used to encrypt the token, and then um, all the rest of the keys are used to decrypt the Fernet token. 
Um, so now, this is how you can configure Fernet, specify where is, what is the repository, and what are the maximum number of keys um, allowed in, uh, in your repository. So with um, Fernet, the keys are very crucial. And uh, the Fernet keys are combination of a signing key and an encrypting key. And it's basically 256 bits of size. So 150, uh, 128 bits for the signing, and then the rest of 128 for encrypting. Now, uh, there are different types of Fernet keys. All of them look pretty much, I mean, all of them look same. But the file names are integers, starting from 0. And if you uh, list a key repository, here is the sample that basically you'll see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 file names. Now, the primary key, the very first type, primary key is uh, used to encrypt and decrypt the token. And then the key file is named uh, with the highest index. The secondary key is only used to decrypt the token. And then it's named uh, bigger, larger than the lowest index, but smaller than, than the highest index. The staged key is uh, de uh, it's used for decrypting, and it's the next key in line to become the primary key. And staged key is always named 0. So let's look at how uh, the, now with the symmetric key encryption, it's very crucial that we rotate these keys and don't, I mean, we just don't be consistent with uh, forever. But so look at how the key rotation works. So if you just set up uh, Fernet keys using the Keystone Manage Fernet setup, uh, it creates two keys. One is the staged key, and one is the primary key. And there are no so secondary keys in case of these two keys. Now uh, we discover that it's time to rotate. So what happens? How do we rotate? You identify what is the next large in largest index which is in this case, it's two. So our staged key becomes the primary key, and the file name is uh, now two. And then what happens is the primary key becomes the secondary key. And um, the new key, the staged key, is introduced, and it is named zero. So now we have three keys on our, in our key repository. Now again, if you let's say it's time to rotate what happens now again discover what is the largest index in this case it is three so our staged key becomes the primary key and then file name is three our primary key becomes the secondary key our secondary key remains the secondary key and then a new staged key is introduced now, for example, when we said that uh, maximum number of active keys in the keystone conf file, let's say we set it to three. So in this case, uh, least secondary key, the file named least, will be deleted. So in our case, one got deleted. So this is the entire uh, Fernet key rotation workflow. Uh, it is a little overwhelming, but um, I tried my best to explain it with the animation. And uh, there are a lot of blogs out there uh, explaining this information. So a um, lot of Keystone uh, team members have done a good job uh, with this kind of um, uh, configuration. So now, um, what, what, how, does, how does this Fernet token is generated? Uh, what does it look like? It, it, is it is basically consisting of these fields. Fernet uh, version, the current timestamp, initialization vector, ciphertext, and HMAC. So the Fernet version, token version, is basically the Fernet, uh, the Fernet version, which is just one version available uh, at this moment. And then the ciphertext is a combination of token payload. So based on what kind of uh, scoping you need, in, uh, basically, if, if you are uh, getting project scope token or domain scope token, it creates a token payload. And then it adds extra padding. Since it's based on the block cipher, it adds extra padding if it's uh, missing. 
the uh, standard size of for the block and then uh, encrypts using the encrypting key and hmac is the combination of all of this and signed so fernet is complicated little with these kind of uh, but it's very uh, secured and we'll we'll look at how uh, it's beneficial to us so now where is the token in our sql backend it's not it's not a persistent token it's not stored anywhere uh, and this is how it looks like so it's pretty much it's very small compared to pki pkiz it's comparable with uuid and yet it is not persistent token format so now if uh, for this kind of uh, fernet the um, our uh, the validation request has to go back to the keystone service how does it work when uh, keystone receives a, a validation request it basically adds uh, the padding which was uh, deleted before creating this token uh, to make it url safe decrypt this token and then determine the uh, what is the version of the token payload uh, like i said it depends on if you are generating the project scope token domain scope token it depends what is the versioning so keystone has a static versioning for example for project scope token it has set the versioning to 2 now it disassembles based on what is the uh, payload and then retrieves the appropriate fields from that payload and then checks whether the token is expired or not and then if the token is revoked or not and then returns the token back to the uh, user or the service now uh, for this kind of token revocation workflow a uh, keystone team has done pretty good job and it's consistent with the all of the rest of the formats but but this is remember this is with the revocation events not the revocation list so it's pretty much same and uh let's say if now i have the multi data center environment where um i have the fernet uh token i initiate a request get the token back and then say give me a new virtual machine nova uh configured with keystone middleware has to go back to keystone now and then keystone validates that fernet token and then returns the uh success i have my vm and i'm happy now i take the same token to a different data center um so nova configured with middleware goes back to sends the validation request back to keystone and then keystone can validate this token now since it's not persistent and keystone can regenerate the token based on the token um data itself and it returns me the uh, new virtual machine even horizon services which integrates directly with keystone can validate this kind of token so it is truly a uh, multi data center uh, it supports truly multi data center environment it is reasonable in size it doesn't need any persistence the only issue that uh, there are blogs out there uh, uh, dolph has done a pretty good job on benchmarking all of the keystone tokens and uh, matt fisher has done a blog on validating and uh, performing benchmarks on the fernet token so the biggest issue here is the token validation time so now as the token revocation events grow the token validation time goes up and also the number of request that it can serve goes down so uh now uh to answer our question so what kind of token format is feasible for the multiple data center deployment it depends well not truly <laughs> um fernet is uh capable of basically it supports multiple data center uh, deployment but you have to watch out for the revocation events and at any point if you have thousands of revocation events i think it's you have to be careful with your deployment uh, so i would conclude that fernet is capable of uh, multiple data center deployment and with that i'll hand over to uh, brad for the horizon usage of tokens thanks priti So I'll next take us through um some of the things we've seen with Horizon when working with these different token formats. 
And this will um, coalesce some of the things that Preeti has been talking about with these tokens. So in a, a real, real world use case of users using Horizon and dealing with multi-data center and some things like that. Um, in Symantec, we've used Horizon um, most of the time we've been using OpenStack, and we found some interesting behaviors with the way Horizon manages tokens. So when logging in, Horizon receives a token using the user's credentials, and this is an important aspect of security in Horizon, that you don't have uh, a service credential for Horizon. So if Horizon is compromised or the token is compromised, an attacker would only have the uh, the, the credentials of the user as opposed to a more a higher level service uh, token. Horizon gets an unscoped token for the user and then based on that gets a project scope token and then we'll get uh, different project scope tokens as the user changes projects. It reuses tokens as much as possible and this is done to reduce the transaction load on Keystone so you don't have too many token creation requests. And then these tokens are stored in the session for each user that's logged in. The session storage is configurable, and this can be done in the local memory cache in the cookie backend, where the, the token is stored in the cookie on the browser side, in the memcache backend, a database, or using memcache and a database, a cache database. So I'll talk some more about the cookie backend and the memcache backend. The cookie backend has some very strong advantages and it's currently the dev stack default. In this case, the token is stored in the browser cookie. And in this case, very important to configure SSL for the horizon connection, since you're gonna have tokens going over the wire and an attacker could see those tokens and use them. Also secure the, the tokens on the server side um, with these um, uh, the configuration values here. And there's some links here to developer docs and the security guide uh, for setting that up. So the cookie backend is highly scalable. You're storing the tokens only on the, the client side with the browser. So reduces the impact of uh, storage needs on the server side. But the main uh, limitation we've run into is this dreaded boot back to login issue. And you might have seen this in the past if, you're, um, if you use Horizon at all. Um, so you come to Horizon and log in like usual, your username and password. And for most browsers, uh, the cookie size is limited to four kilobytes. So if you have a more complex Keystone deployment with a lot of endpoints in the catalog, you sign in and what you see is this. So you're back to the login screen and very confusing for your users. And what's happened in this case is the cookie has overflowed, uh, normally due to a lot of Keystone endpoints in the catalog and the token becoming too large for the cookie. So to deal with that issue, one of the things we've done is switch to the memcache backend and this allows for uh, larger token sizes to be stored. Tokens are stored on the server side, so you don't have these issues of overflowing browser cookies. Requires memcached to be running, and then Horizon configured to look for the sessions in memcached. And can also be used with a backing database, so that you have the cache and then the, the, the database behind it. And this is what we currently use in Symantec, uh, what we've done to resolve some of these issues. Another thing that's been done in the past to reduce the impact of these large token sizes is token hashing. This is done in the Django OpenStack auth project. This is a dependency of Horizon and keeps the stored token data small as you're storing just the hash of the token. Um, We've had some issues in the past with um, this functionality getting broken. Um, and so it's currently not working on the master branch for PKI tokens. So we've got a new config value in Liberty to disable it. And that's shown here. 
Um, but you need to be careful when doing this in a production environment, as if you disable hashing, then you're storing the whole PKI token on the server side. Um, it works fine with Kilo Horizon, and that's what we currently use. Um, but just keep in mind that on the master branch, you may have some issues there. Next, I wanted to talk about multi-region in Horizon. Horizon has a, a concept of service regions versus authentication regions. So the service regions are what you've probably seen in the, the top center of the Horizon interface. And these are different regions that are part of the same Keystone catalog. So you might even have separate Keystone endpoints for different regions in that same catalog. But for that to work properly, those different Keystone endpoints have to be able to authenticate each other's tokens or you'll have issues. So if you have Keystone endpoints that um, that can't authenticate each other's tokens, those need to be specified as different authentication regions in the available regions. So for UUID, PKI, and PKIZ, without token replication uh, across your backends, which is generally infeasible in production, they, you won't be able to authenticate those tokens across regions. So generally you would need to have those set as different authentication regions. But as we've um, discussed in some other slides, for net tokens do work between different keystone endpoints. And so this should help us out in Horizon, um, possibly having uh, different service regions uh, with different keystone instances. So to get into more about for net tokens and Horizon, yes, they do work uh, right out of the box. Um, Liberty and beyond, no patch is necessary. Um, so right out of the box in that case. If you're using Kilo, you do need a patch for Django OpenStack Auth, and the patch is here. And this, this next topic is a, a little bit off topic from the different Keystone token types, but I wanted to mention it as some work that's going on uh, in Horizon right now in the community. Um, support for V3 Keystone domains via Horizon. So if you're not using domains, um, you're fine at this point. Uh, you use project scope tokens for basically everything you do. Um, if you're using V3 though, and you have domains, you need to manage those domains with domain scope tokens. And Horizon doesn't currently support this. So this requires changes to the Django OpenStack auth project and also to Horizon. This is planned for the Mitaka release currently. And there's some info here on usage. Uh, we currently use it in Symantec in production. Um, documentation here is a bit out of date, but just see me if you're interested in, in doing this. Um, then as far as getting this into community, these are the, the current domains patches that are out for review. So still working those. So to come back to Fernet tokens, will they solve all our problems? And we've seen that the smaller token size, very useful. Um, no persistence for tokens. So the no persistence provides us the seamless authentication across regions. Um, so it should be much easier for taking a token from one keystone and being able to, to validate it with another keystone. But we have seen those performance issues. If you have a lot of token revocation events in your environment, you may see uh, performance issues. So consider that as you're uh, taking a look at possibly moving to Fernet at this point. And with that, thanks for all your time. And if you have questions, uh, we can take those now. And we have a microphone in back, is that right? Hi, um, my name is Imtiaz. Uh, question about Fernet token. If the tokens are not persisted in backend, how does the association between token to user metadata is kept? 
or managed? So the token is, so the entire payload is encrypted and signed, and it's part of the token. But if anybody retrieves, if, if the token gets to anybody, an attacker, he cannot decrypt the token and get all this information because you need the keys to uh, basically decrypt and uh, get the... So Keystone can regenerate what the token payload is from the token itself. The Keystone service can do it. So that's why there is no persistence needed in case of Fernet. Uh, not so much a question as a, as a remark. Um, without taking away anything from the benefit of using for net tokens, uh, but uh, your suggestion is that you cannot do multi-region uh, with UUID tokens, and if you use federation, you, you can. You just put a SAML IDP in front of it, and then you have a, a, a valid SAML assertion that works across regions, and then you use a new Keystone token, but that's all... Um, invisible to the user, so it, it's not impossible to use UID right, tokens. Right, right, yeah. So with fed, fed, Federation, it is possible, but the way uh, um, I, I'd shown it, like you have LDAP, which is replicated, then it's not, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, is it on? Awesome. Uh, Dolph Matthews, retired Keystone PTL. Um, I had my hand designing, maintaining, supporting everything in this presentation. Uh, and I just want to say thank you. Awesome job. Everything was totally accurate, plus two. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Any more questions? Or feel free to. Uh, so that has to be done using basically a deployment tool. And you, uh, so when you synchronize it, so it doesn't have to be synchronized at the same time. For example, since the primary key, once you reach the primary key, you encrypt it with the primary key, but the decryption happens with all the list of keys that are in the re repository. So it doesn't have to happen at the same time, uh, the uh, synchronization. Let's say you, you uh, update a repository in one data center, and then after that, f after a few minutes, or you know, there's, it's possible to have that lag, time lag. its authentication mechanism. Do you know, are you guys, any of you working on that, or is that some other? Uh, no. None of that. Maybe somebody okay. from Keystone. Just curious. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't have the microphone, but yeah. So just a question on, I know they're integrating Kubernetes, Google Kubernetes in with Keystone authentication. Um, I just wondered, I think it's fairly new, um, but I know there's some work going on there. Just wondered, but anyway. Can I trust the, the, the token, the Fernet token, by using the, the current um, trust mechanism? Uh, sorry, I didn't no. hear that. If I want to trust the token, you want yeah, by using the, the OpenStack token mechanism, I you don't understand. I didn't get that. Could you put the microphone a little yeah. closer? Yeah, maybe. OK. If you want to trust a token, trust by using trust. the trust. Oh, okay. Okay, by using the current trusting mechanism, is it possible to use it by using the different token or not? Uh, I think it is. Yes, it is yes. possible. I, you can generate a trust scope token in okay. Fernet. Yeah. And uh, can I list, uh, suppose that you have uh, two regions, like the, your picture when the user try to, to create yes. a new virtual machine the second domain. Can I list uh, the user um, in the second? Uh, suppose I, I have the same project in, this, in the both regions, but uh, the, 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 the user created the token in the first region, 
and uh, probably this, the, the user is not uh, yet uh, in, the, in the keystone of the second region. And um, when I ask for the list of users... Right. So uh, let's say if you don't have the users replicated, yeah. then it wouldn't work. So it doesn't Because for doesn't that, exist, no? yes, you need the, all the users to be replicated okay. and all the other resources, for example, projects, domain, roles, assignments, all of this information replicated across so multiple data centers. So the user doesn't exist uh, in the second region. You understand? No. No. There is no persistent uh, in the database. Right. Okay. You have two keystone sites, two sites with two keystones, and are not, there are no correlations. Um, no? No. Um, no data replication. Okay. You have two keystones. Uh -huh. the, data, the database are not uh, uh, duplicated. Uh -huh. The replication uh, is not yet yes, set up. Okay. One user create a token in the first keystone, okay, and then try to use the same token in the second keystone. But the second keystone, the user doesn't exist. No, because the user doesn't and exist. The, and the mechanism doesn't work. Yes. Okay. And there's also another concern there about um, for the tokens to work across keystones, you would need to have the, the keystone projects uh, duplicated across, um, so to be uh, replicating back and forth. Because okay. if you have a, a token scoped to a project, and then you, uh, you go and use it against a different project, it won't work either. Okay, okay thanks a lot. Um. I, ha I think uh, there's one more question. So you kept saying that um, the performance went down if you had new rep uh, revocation records. Is there a mechanism to clean up the records? Like old records after a period of time saying like, uh, oh, they're there expired? There is. So uh, basically when, the, when a new revocation event is created, the, oh, all the expired events are getting deleted. And that's when it Im gets impacted. Basically, uh, so you can set a separate, like a flush job, and then revoke all the uh, expired events. But I think uh, Matt did some research, and I, I, I don't have numbers for that, but um, I think that didn't help either. Like in case of UUID, you flush the token backend, and then you pretty much gain more. I mean, you get back that performance. But with revocation events, it was not the case. I have a I'm question. getting the cut sign, so I think we'll have to stop it here. So come uh, let us know yeah, if you have questions. Yeah, and thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining thank you. us.